Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, and uh, thanks to Cameron and to Garth Hunt and to Peter Hamburger as well for this kind invitation. I had the great privilege of working um, under Peter Hamburger my first year in Prime Minister and Cabinet, and uh, I had come off doing a PhD in political history and thought that I knew a thing or two about politics and quickly knew recognised once I got into Prime Minister and Cabinet that I didn't really know that much at all about how politics actually worked. Um, but it was one of the great privileges of my time in the public service to have worked with Peter and I, I learnt a great deal from him and he was a fantastic support to me. So it's great to see Peter Hamburger again. Um, just before beginning too, I was advised the other day uh, of some news uh, that basically amounts to a complete failure of this book to... Uh, uh, to cut through in the American debate in some ways. One of the problems that the Americans had throughout the 1960s was getting Gough Whitlam's name right. And uh, in some of the briefings that I looked at throughout the 1960s, and it, even when he's Prime Minister, uh, you know, he's referred to as Wicklam, uh, Whitman, you know, as in Walt Whitman. Um, he would have been quite touched by that. Uh, Wicklow, an Irish touch. Uh, and then the first name they struggle with, some... US presidents are told that, that goth rhymes with tough, which even allowing for a southern drawl for, for, uh, for uh, Lyndon Johnson was a bit of a stretch. But anyway, a friend of mine said that he uh, had ordered the book off Amazon and that the receipt came through and it was called Unholy Fury, Watlam and Nixon at War. So <laughs> you can't win. Anyway, um, now at face value, this book that I've just published on the American Alliance and the Whitman Nixon era is tailor-made for drama and confrontation. The general outline of the story is, I think, well known to most of you. Here we had a veritable fan tale of sparks that virtually set relations alight in this period and plunged the alliance to its lowest ever level then or since. If it wasn't the inflamed throats of Labor ministers hurling abuse and insults at Nixon in response to the controversial Christmas bombings of December 1972, it was a new Labor Prime Minister directly appealing to both the United States and North Vietnam to return to the negotiations, thus putting Washington on a level pegging with its communist enemy. This was what the Americans found unthinkable, that Australia had gone almost overnight from being one of its staunchest allies to one of its chief critics. If it wasn't Australian maritime unions placing a ban on all American ships unloading at Australian ports, a move which the American International Longshoresmen Association reci reciprocated. Uh, it was Whitlam threatening to take the, U the Americans to the UN if the bombing of North Vietnam resumed. And then, of course, there was the American response. The veiled threats, the contemptuous dismissal of Whitlam by Nixon and Kissinger as a lightweight, a peacenik and a bastard. The refusal for nearly five months to invite the Australian Prime Minister to the White House. The lack of any kind of welcome mat when he got there. And as I lay out in great detail in the book, and as Cameron mentioned in his introduction, concern in Washington about Whitlam and his Labor government did reach such feverish levels, particularly after Cairns. Jim Cairns became Deputy Prime Minister after the 1974 election. So feverish that President Nixon gave serious thought to cutting off intelligence sharing, drastically reducing military cooperation, and relocating American security installations out of the country. And there were hardliners in the national security community in Washington, in particular the Secretary of Defence, James Schlesinger, who was ready to abandon Australia at this point. He'd had enough. He already asked his advisers to look at alternative locations for American intelligence installations. Now, had Nixon done so, of course, the alliance would have been left as little more than a brittle chrysalis. So for a moment, in mid-1974, Australia's alliance with the United States was perched precariously on the edge of an abyss. But I'd like to speak tonight about what I see as some of the broader implications to emerge from this research. The first relates to some of the extraordinarily resilient historical themes which permeate today's debate over the Alliance. The second relates to the limits of memory and sentiment as forces which can ultimately sustain the relationship. And the third, briefly, is concerned with how the Alliance withstood the strife and the trauma that besieged it in this era. First, the historical interpretations. I think that for too long, 
the subject of Australian-American relations has been buffeted by two quite strong prevailing interpretative winds. And the book, in a sense, is challenging both of these interpretations, which I believe are still very prevalent and in, indeed quite powerful in the current debate. The first and most powerful view arises from what is known as a radical nationalist version of Australian history, in which the country has been prevented from achieving its true potential on account of a slavish devotion to great and powerful friends, Britain and America. This interpretation portrays the alliance as an embarrassing saga of unending and uncritical servility, a relationship that is detrimental to Australia's self-worth, a pact encased in the permafrost of Harold Holt's all the way with LBJ statement of July 1966. Now this view I think often suffers from a kind of metaphorical measles in which Australia suffers from some type of disease or status anxiety being either a suckling society, a sycophant, a satrapy, a satellite, a colony, a lickspittal or a vassal. Now according to this myth, <clears throat> Australians have blindly followed America with scant regard for the nation's own interests. And such a reading of the past, which often draws on the wars in which the nation has fought alongside America, or the international crises in which it has given the United States vocal support, typically incorporates one or another of the following themes. That Australia has since the signing of the ANZUS Treaty behaved as the subservient partner in the alliance, which reflects a deep-seated tradition of colonial dependency. That as a consequence of this satellite mentality, Australia has been prevented from achieving its independence and thus from fully engaging with Asia. And that occasional disagreements between Australian leaders and their great and powerful friends constitute heroic declarations of national independence. And yet some of the more recent scholarship in the field, I think over uh, recent years, has shown that during the Cold War, Australian politicians and policymakers used the alliance for their own national interest purposes, namely keeping the Americans engaged in Southeast Asia. In other words, they used dependency to support Australian national objectives. <coughs> now, it may be questioned, of course, whether the Australian policies were wise, especially intervention in Vietnam. But there's no question, I think, that the Australian government, in responding to the great post-World War II changes in the region, adopted distinctive strands which were intended to safeguard Australia's peculiar interests in those changes. Now, closely related to this radical nationalist interpretation, but with significant differences, is a view which holds that Australia, on account of its small to middle power status, has had limited freedom of movement within the alliance, and therefore feels the need to pay regular insurance premiums to the United States, most notably in Vietnam, later in Iraq and Afghanistan, in order to ensure that America will come to Australia's aid in a time of crisis. For better or worse, Australia has no other option but to follow America's lead, according to this view. But such an interpretation fails to ask the crucial, crucial question, what are the historical grounds for believing that loyal support for a great power ally, or any ally, will be reciprocated when the country giving the support is in need. Now, the second dominant view, <clears throat> emerging more strongly, I think, over the last decade, draws on the more boisterous ideological worldview of the Cold War. Here, the mantra is that Australia, by virtue of its alliance with the United States, punches above its weight in world affairs. It declares that the period from the signing of the ANZUS Treaty through to the mid-1960s was a golden age in the alliance, and that the post-9-11 era has witnessed a return to these heights. As John Howard put it in 2003, he said, and I quote, the importance of national security issues now rivals the importance they occupied in the 1950s and 60s. The alliance, he predicted, would grow more rather than less important as the years go by. And certainly, I think you would have to concede that Howard is right. We are living in an extraordinary period of bipartisan support for the alliance. And in many ways, the visit by Obama in 2011 was symptomatic of the way in which the Americans are taking the alliance to the next level. I mean, the Deputy Security, National Security Advisor Ben Rhodes said, in coming to Australia, we're not coming to a far-flung part of the world anymore. We're actually taking this alliance to the next level. Arguably, I think Australia is more important to the United States now than it was 
during the Cold War. Equally, though, it's important not to assume too easily, I think, that common values, interests and outlook shared by the two countries provide a foundation for the alliance that will endure irrespective of future crises or possible divergent interests. I think we should be cautious. Now, the point about these two interpretations, which I would argue are still quite dominant in the contemporary debate, is that they warp our understanding of the alliance at the height of the Cold War. And it's that period that is quite critical, I think, to understanding why Gough Whitlam sought to update the alliance for the new domestic and international circumstances that he faced in the 1970s. The first half of the book is, in fact, dedicated to trying to, to give the context for how Whitlam sought to change the meaning and the interpretation of the alliance in Australian political culture and, of course, in the rhetoric about Australia's engagement with the world. I think the deeper truth for the alliance from the time of its inception in 1951 to the Whitlam era is that the very term ANZUS had evolved from a simple treaty obligation to a template for the relationship as a whole. But it was a common currency freighted with unfulfilled expectations on both sides. Up until the time of Whitlam's election, it was the Australian governments of Menzies and his successors that kept asking for the ultimate guarantee from presidents in Washington. It was these leaders who were seemingly indefatigable in trying to divine in the word, words of Article 4 of the ANZUS Treaty the ironclad commitment of the United States to Australia's national security. And they did so, it has to be conceded, with little success. Now, while Australians, just to tease this out a little bit further, Australians would no doubt have welcomed the National Security Council's 1961 assessment that their country was, quote, one of the ultimate bastions of the free world, free world in the Far East. All right. The old term terminology from the time. But I think they found, especially in the 60s, that such rhetoric did not always translate into the intimacy of access to US decision-making processes for which they had long hoped. And that had been a, a frustration of Percy Spender when the treaty was signed in 51, as I'm sure many of you know. Moreover, at key moments during the Cold War, Australians found that their priorities and interests in the region collided with those of Washington as much as they coincided. Most significantly in the early 1960s, the two countries disagreed over whether Indonesia should be allowed to annex the Dutch-held territory of West New Guinea and over President Sukarno's policy of confrontation towards the new Malaysian Federation. I think it is remarkable, actually, when you're going through the files to see just how much time President John F. Kennedy, for example, spent in meeting with Garfield Barwick and Howard Beale and Harold Holt and Prime Minister Menzies on ironing out the differing Australian and American expectations of just precisely what Article 4 of ANZUS obliged the Americans to do in the event of a crisis, in the event of Australians and Indonesians coming to grief, coming into conflict in the confrontation episode. And it should come as no surprise, I think, given what the Americans had on their plate at this time, that the Americans concluded that ANZUS obliged them to do very little at all. Now, Kennedy's brutal reminder to Barwick when discussions over possible American assistance during the confrontation crisis, when these, con when these discussions were at their peak, Kennedy said to Barwick, the American people and the Congress, he said, quote, had forgotten about ANZUS. I think this sent shockwaves all the way to Canberra. All that Menzies could subsequently tell the Parliament in 1964, he said, was that ANZUS was based on the utmost goodwill which I argue here is a remarkably shallow commodity on which to base Australia's faith in the alliance. And mindful of John F. Kennedy's views on this question, uh, Arthur Tang told his minister, Paul Hasluck, in 1965, he said, we have been put on notice by a former president that the American understanding of its obligations was such as to exclude help from them to Australia in certain circumstances. Now, as a consequence... Hasluck, in responding to Tang, he said he believed that the best policy was simply to keep quiet. The more, he said, we try to spell out the meaning of Article 4, the narrower that meaning will become. Now, the problem is it was advice that, wasn't, that was very rarely followed 
by Hasluck's successors and some of his colleagues. So these episodes and Washington's reluctance to promise military assistance in the event of Australia becoming involved in armed conflict with Indonesian forces raised doubts about the meaning of the ANZUS alliance and about Australia's ability to rely on America for support or even consultation about issues which touched its vital interests in the region. Even the euphoria that accompanied President Johnson's visit to Australia in October 1966 was relatively short-lived. Yes, Holt got a fantastic bounce out of the polls and a landslide victory, no question about that, and gained great kudos from the visit. But what else did he gain? That's the question. All the major American de decisions subsequently relating to the withdrawal of troops from Vietnam and its efforts to reach peace terms with the enemy were carried out without any prior discussions with the Australians. And this provoked yet again another round of introspection in Canberra as to the meaning of the alliance. Now, as I've tried to show <coughs> in the book as well, remarkably, this Australian persistence to extract a firmer security guarantee from the Americans lasted through the prime ministerships of John Gordon and William McMahon. Gordon, in particular, was keen to receive American assurances about ANZUS before committing Australian forces to the defence of Malaysia and Singapore. One State Department official, speaking of Gorton before he arrived there for his first visit as Prime Minister, said that the Australian leader, he said, was so blunt, so direct quote, so down to earth, so desirous of a man-to-man -man approach, so impatient of formalities and diplomatic nuances that literally any kind of assurance from us on ANZUS might hit the, spot, hit the spot. It went on, he's the sort of man who, if he hits it off with the President, he's talking about Lyndon Johnson here on Gordon's first visit, if he hits it off with the President, he might even be content with an oral exchange and a handshake over a scotch and soda. <laughs> <clears throat> now, of course, this is not to belittle uh, these Prime Ministers in this period uh, who are searching for those critical words of reassurance. And uh, in many ways, McMahon is similar. McMahon doesn't get the golden words of assurance from Nixon, so he in fact does it for Nixon and gives a, a reply at a toast uh, at the White House on his visit there in 1971, in which he says that ANZUS is just as fresh as the day on which it was signed, and uh, we look to you for protection. So this is not to belittle these Prime Ministers, I think they were dealing with seismic changes in Australia's outlook and orientation on the world. They were dealing with, in effect, the British entry into the European community, or at least the British attempt to get in, it didn't come until 73, but the game was well and truly up about British intentions to enter the European community, the British withdrawal from east of Suez, and of course the Nixon Doctrine in July of 1969, which talked about a different posture for the United States in Asia. But the point is too that these leaders are engaged in the period before Whitlam comes into office in this kind of perpetual augury of the alliance. I mean, you can almost see them there picking over the entrails, if you like, of the treaty and trying to work out what it means for Australia. And unfortunately for them, the portents are never quite as hopeful as they want them to be. But as I said, <clears throat> this alliance freighted with unfulfilled expectations on both sides. Uh, this is not to say that there was just this Australian problem with trying to divine what ANZUS meant. I think the American uh, political community, policy community, struggled to come to terms with a changing Australia in the late 1960s. From the United States perspective, a more assertive Australia presented both opportunities and obstacles. On the one hand, <clears throat> the prospect of a key regional ally assuming greater defence responsibilities was precisely the model envisaged by the Americans as they looked to recalibrate their posture in Asia in the wake of the Nixon Doctrine. This was precisely what they were looking for, for allies to stand more on their own two feet. But on the other hand, this new Australia was a curious mix in the American view of truculence, requiring more careful management and trepidation in search of even more soothing American words about consultation and coordination of policy. Crucially, however, I think this period is very important. This is before Whitman comes to office, that some American officials in Washington, and in Canberra in particular, believe that it's time to ditch the usual clichés, as they put it, about the alliance, and to embark on a wholesale renovation of alliance ritual. 
I mean, Donald Horne talks a lot about the mystique of the Alliance in this period, the rites and rituals in terms of the, the coronations on the South Lawn of the White House, the toasts given at, at state dinners. But in the late 60s, in response to the difficulties that they were having with Gorton, the American Embassy in Canberra is sending back very different types of messages to Washington. We've been old allies, said one assessment in 1969, back to the State Department. But rhetoric and sentimentality must give way to mutual accommodation. The Coral Sea generation, it went on, is being replaced by a new generation in Australia that is critical, discerning and increasingly nationalistic. I think this statement showed a growing realisation that the stoic words of wartime cooperation in the Pacific had definable limits. Although Australia remained what the US referred to as a strategic anchor for the US, South of Asia and between the Pacific and Indian Oceans, the Americans now had to deal with the widespread fear among the Canberra political elite that the United States, they said, may in a pinch regard Australia as expendable. And their advice was, they said, it's clear then, then that the era has passed when Australia felt secure as a little brother of the United States. And so embassy staff in Washington were urging their colleagues back in the American capital to accommodate themselves to this new reality. I think that advice fell on deaf ears in Washington. The White House under Nixon was consumed with ending the Vietnam War and implementing significant change in US grand strategy, of course, with the opening to China and with detente with the Soviet Union. So much so that when the political fortune changed for Labor in Australian politics, Washington was left reeling. Now, there is a great deal of attention in Washington to Whitlam as the rising star, uh, and they see Whitlam as a moderate that they can deal with. They're very happy to see the disappearance of Corwell, who they uh, write off as ageing and ineffectual. Um, but nevertheless, they're aware of Whitlam's record on the alliance. I mean, in 19... 64, Whitlam has told an American embassy official he sees the US alliance as a temporary arrangement. This is something that Australia has with the United States, he says, for the time being. But in future, we might not need it as Australia starts to think in more regional terms. These sorts of statements ring alarm bells in diplomatic corridors in Washington. Whitlam is saying in the late 60s that the alliance needs to change from a purely military alliance or it will die. He uh, becomes a lot more trenchant in his critique of the Vietnam War, of course, after the Tet Offensive. Um, and he says that one of the more constructive tasks for statesmanship in the 1970s will be to channel the alliance in more fruitful, fruitful directions. He says this can't be just a huddling together of three white, old white powers in the Pacific. OK, so this is what Whitlam is doing. He's trying to update the alliance for the new circumstances, but all the time, he's protecting his flank by saying that Vietnam is stopping the Americans from returning to their rightful place as the leader of the free world and saying that America is the most general and idealistic, generous and idealistic nation and that Vietnam is halting that. Still, of course, it has to be conceded the speed of the change that Whitlam brought to office when he's first elected in 1972. This takes the Americans still somewhat by surprise, so much so that at the end of 1972, Marshall Green, who at that point is Assistant Secretary of State for East Asia, noted that, he said, on the question of style, Whitlam had been a whirling dervish, which essentially meant, he said, moving on matters of vital interest to the United States without the prior consultation that we've come to expect from Australia. All right, the reaction is very swift from Washington. Temperatures increase. I mean, Nixon is saying all sorts of things at this time about how can allies turn on you like this? It's too much the fashion, Nixon says, for allies to keep kicking the bejesus out of America. Our reactions can't be sensitive, he says, but they have to be coldly proper. We can't show that it's too easy to kick us around. In other words, <clears throat> from 1972, the tables were turned in this relationship. Now it's the US government that begins to dangle the ANZUS Treaty as a threat, a warning that the guarantee may become infirm. Yet all the while, the Nixon White House assumed that they were talking to the same kinds of Australian leaders that had sat opposite them in the 1950s and 60s. This then, I think, is a vivid and verifiable illustration of the dr dramatic change that Whitlam brought to the alliance relationship. His style, outlook and policy agenda were an affront 
to the official American understanding of how the alliance ought to work and how Australia ought to behave as an ally. And yet, they're constantly making these threats. William Rogers, Henry Kissinger, Richard Nixon, James Schlesinger are constantly saying the more that Gough Whitlam and Australian ministers criticise the Nixon White House, the more they criticise treaties like CEDAW, the more ANZUS itself will come under threat. But because successive administrations in Washington had watered down the security provisions in ANZUS to such an extent, I think these threats started to lose a bit of the menace. All right, And Australians and indeed the British at this time, who were also uh, copying regular broad, broadsides from Nixon and Kissinger, and in fact the, the, uh, the British intelligence is switched off for a while in 74, uh, the British-US intelligence link. Um, but these menace in the threat, threats carry much less force. Okay, but I think this frisson and this tension and trauma between Whitlam and Nixon clearly has a deeper source. There were tectonic plates moving beneath the surface of these political events. The virtual end of the Cold War in East Asia had clearly meant different things to the foreign policy establishments in Canberra and in Washington. For Washington, it meant a careful, calibrated reframing of their regional stance. Détente, in the Nixon-Kissinger view, was a fragile balancing act, a state of affairs that needed careful tendering, careful management. The enemy was still at the gates. American power had to be preserved. Its credibility in the face of allies maintained. When Peter Walensky goes to Washington in May 1973 to finally try and organise for Whitlam to get through the gates of the White House, Kissinger says to him, look, there are still minimum power positions that America has to maintain, and these might not be morally uplifting or emotionally satisfying, but this is our responsibility as a great power, and we wish that Australia might recognise this a little bit more. Um, for Canberra, under a new Labor government, the breakdown of the rigid bipolarity of the Cold War gave Whitlam the freedom to experiment with new ideas about regional architecture, zones of peace and neutrality, and updating these kinds of relationships. Remember, Whitlam gave specific instructions to diplomats <coughs> that America was to be treated as a foreign country in the same way that Australia would treat its relations with Germany, Japan or France. Now, that kind of language, given the intimacy of the relationship, notwithstanding the doubts over ANZUS, given the intimacy of the relationship during the Cold War, that kind of language, you can understand why that for some in Canberra that was seen as a kind of a heresy um, but for Whitlam, <clears throat> détente was a thrilling release from the straitjacket of the Cold War. Australia, he told the National Press Club in Washington in July 1973, needed an ideological holiday. <coughs> so these were ideas and approaches that clearly unnerved an American elite that had come to expect predictable behaviour from its junior ally. And Australia, as I try to show in the book, became something of a thorn in America's Asian side during the life of this Whitlam Labor government. Much of the argument that was used to break down Nixon's resistance to hosting Whitlam in the White House in July 1973 centred on the perception that Australia was moving in a hasty and haphazard fashion in dealing with Asia. Kissinger even suggested to Nixon that an encounter with the Australian leader would be useful if only, Kissinger said, to make completely clear to Whitlam the extent to which we see his Asian policies cutting across our own. Kissinger, moreover, said that such a meeting might help keep Whitlam in line on Asia policy. There's a constant sort of expectation that, in time, this errant ally will be given an education about the facts of life and will be brought back into line and will come back under the protective American embrace, back under the, the American wing. When he outlined the Australian leader's schedule in Washington, Kissinger stressed that a central message to convey was, quote, our belief that the interrelationship of our two Asian policies is not a question falling completely outside our ANZUS relationship. So Kissinger is constantly pointing to this widening gap in Australian and US foreign policies and a divergence of approaches, as, on, approaches on key regional policy issues, especially the future of the Southeast Asian Treaty Organisation, the future of the five power defence arrangement for Malaysia and Singapore, and Whitlam's support for this idea of zones of peace and neutrality in Southeast Asia. I think it showed, yet again, the American dilemma. Eager, on the one hand, to recognise a more nationalistic Australia, 
that can take up some of the slack in Southeast Asia, but resentful and troubled when that new stance appeared to work directly against its own regional policy. Now, although there was general acceptance in Washington that Australia did not perceive Asia as a threat in this period and that Whitlam wanted to deepen his country's involvement in regional affairs, it was the way Kissinger said, it was the way that Whitlam, quote, vigorously resisted any suggestion that the alliance carried any obligation to support major US policies in Asia. This is what really got under the skin of the Americans for all the abuse and the insults, what the Americans used to call Australian monstrosities, you know, when Australian ministers would, would uh, call them maniacs and thugs and all the rest of it. Really, when it boils down to it, this is what gets under their skin. And of course, it's the threat that they see Labor's left wing poses to American intelligence installations. So let me make a few final remarks. Now, the aim of the book, I think, is to try and show um, that the rift between Whitlam and Nixon was not simply the result of suspicion engendered by a Republican president towards a new left of centre Australian Prime Minister. But it is certainly the case, I think, that Labor, in American eyes, carried a great deal of baggage with it when it finally came to power in 1972. Rightly or wrongly, it had been virtually ingrained uh, in the DNA of Washington's foreign policy establishment that Labor posed serious difficulties for the alliance, that in effect it was spoiling to expel the US intelligence facilities from Australian soil. Now, the nuance of Corwell's position in May of 1965, opposing the Vietnam War but supporting the alliance, was, I would argue, basically lost in the American foreign policy establishment. Okay? And no matter how many times Whitlam, who visits Washington every year from 66, 67 onwards, no matter how many times he reassures his American interlocutors, senior people in the State Department, that it's OK, whilst I believe that uh, these intelligence installations are a kind of a grim and awful necessity of part of the, the Cold War, I will nevertheless defend them within the party, so you can trust me, and the Americans appreciate this. Nevertheless, there's still a great deal of fear and anxiety in American circles. On top of this, of course, Nixon and Kissinger are engaged in a delicate diplomacy to extract the United States from a disastrous war in Vietnam. They didn't take kindly to being placed on the same level as their communist enemy, much less by a Labor leader. They saw rushing headlong to officially recognise communist governments both in Asia and in Europe. As one American official in Canberra recalled, Whitlam was just itching to get at it. Failing to understand Whitlam's new nationalism, a panicked American political elite schooled in the doctrines and dogma of the Cold War, saw not a model Nixon doctrine country trying to stand on its own two feet, but an ally embracing the isolationist left and vacating the arena. This is another constant refrain you get from Nixon and Kissinger, that Whitlam is an isolationist, he's flirting with neutrality, he's defecting from the Western alliance. More particularly, though, <clears throat> this period of strife in the alliance amounted to a breakdown in a mutual view of the world. Although the two countries had disagreed over fundamental policies in the 1950s and 60s, especially where Indonesia was concerned, nevertheless the tensions had been contained within a tight rhetorical and ideological bond born out of World War II and sanctified by the global struggle against what both saw as a monolithic communist enemy. Only under the greatest provocation, such as Nixon's metamorphosis over China policy in the early 1970s, only then did the strains in the alliance seep into the public domain. But the change comes in this period, I think, with Whitlam. As the world situation changed so rapidly, the two countries came to have increasingly different conceptions of the Cold War struggle. And as the guiding framework for that struggle came under pressure, Australia was one of a number of close US allies to chart a new path in the region and the world. Out of that experience, I think, came a new definition of the alliance, and one that was broadly followed by successive governments on both sides of Australian politics. For all the abuse and the insults, Whitlam ushered in the maturation process that the Australian-American alliance simply had to have, this period of greater self-reliance within and without the alliance. And the point is, despite how low things sank in this period, the alliance was ultimately strong enough to withstand it. 
So as I make the point in the book, <clears throat> my final two points, this is not to elevate Whitlam as a, as a Labor hero poking President Nixon in the eye and beating the drum of Australian nationalism all the way to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. At no stage did this Labor leader ever ad advocate walking out on ANZUS. In fact, he strove constantly to make the alliance work better for Australian national interests. In the face of enormous pressure from his political opponents, from public and editorial opinion, and from within his own bureaucracy, Whitlam nevertheless held his line. He understood that the alliance had to change to suit the new world of the 1970s, and he was genuine in his desire to see the United States emerge from the morass of Vietnam and return to its role as the most generous, idealistic nation. Future historians who examine the relationship in the 21st century will have to account for why both sides of Australian politics have now returned, in some ways, to the unqualified rhetoric of the Cold War, whether it be John Howard's classification of Australia as a 100% US ally, or Julia Gillard's solemn declaration of Australia as, quote, an ally for all the years to come, there is a new intensity for the public rhetoric of the alliance in the Asian century. But, I would just say, the current forces in play are not sufficient to dismiss the relevance of past examples of divergence in the alliance. In fact, we may even be entering a period where disagreements between Canberra and Washington are likely to increase. And I would argue it's only at these moments where we have these dilemmas of divergence that the alliance is truly tested. Thank you.